You may not have heard of the screener as Matt has asthma. Matt has asthma. Dang it. You may not have heard of the screener as Matt has asthma and Burke Sharpless, but they have written some pretty lousy movies like Gods of Egypt, The Last Witch Hunter, and yes, Morbius. Critics are rather unforgiving when reviewing their movies, and a lot of people today haven't even heard of or seen their older works. So, we decided to watch every single movie these two goobers have written or have been involved in, so we can finally find out if they are in fact the worst writing duo in Hollywood. Before we dive in, I am Detective Mio. And I am Inspector Keto. And the first movie we'll be covering is Dracula Untold. Released in 2014, with a budget of about $70 million, the movie was originally going to be directed by Alex Proyas, or however you say that name. It was to be filmed in Australia, but Universal, who was producing the film, cut ties with Proyas for some reason and got an Irish director instead, and the film was shot in Ireland. Interestingly enough, Proyas would later direct a different movie that Mark and Brooke would write for, and that movie would be shot in Australia. So it all comes full circle, doesn't it? The movie stars Luke Evans, who also played Bard in the Hobbit trilogy, as Vlad, our main character. Dominic Cooper, who also plays the villain in The Princess, plays the villain in this movie, Sultan Mehmed. And Charles Dance, who's in a lot of different stuff, such as Game of Thrones, and uh, he was also in a Godzilla movie once, he plays the first vampire. Now on to this story. When the 15th century, when the Ottoman Empire still existed, and right now, Turks are taking the Transylvanian boys from their families. One of these boys was the rightful prince of Transylvania, and his name was Vlad. He was super good at impaling people. Even the mention of his name made enemies lose control of their bladders. The world would come to know him as... Dracula. But Vlad then got the ick from his gruesome deeds and went on to bury his past and became the ruler of Transylvania. Now this opening isn't necessarily bad, but it is pretty annoying that it's all told via a voiceover, something that pops up far too often with these writers. This beginning is also only slightly accurate to history. We won't necessarily nitpick too much just because this is clearly a fictional movie featuring vampires. Vlad rules his land and everything is currently at peace, but then he finds evidence that the Ottoman Empire might attack. So they search a cave for some sneaky Turks, but then they find a monster instead. And after it kills all his men, Vlad learns from the monk, Brother Lucian, that it is in fact a vampire that lives in those caves. Vlad then goes back home and is a little bit on edge, but he and his wife share a bath together. Ah, how romantic. Later, while celebrating Easter, there is conflict. The Turks march in and demand 1,000 boys for their army. And after pleading with the Sultan, Vlad's son is also to be shipped off. Not good. When the Turks come to take Vlad's son, Vlad kills them, basically declaring war. In desperate need for the story to actually begin, Vlad goes back to the vampire cave and asks the vampire for his power, which the vampire is pretty cool with. Vlad drinks the vampire's blood, so now he's super strong, as seen when he tries to get up, but destroys a rock instead. Vlad's powers include turning into bats, and flying, super strength, and the ability to talk to animals, or something. His powers only last three days, during which he has to resist the temptation to drink human blood, or else he'll be a vampire forever, and the original gangster vampire in the cave will be free. Now the Turks are upon them, and Vlad steps out of his castle to go fight every single one of them by himself. And fight he does, in some of the jankiest movie action I've seen in a long time. It is a spectacle that has to be seen to be believed. When Vlad turns into bats, it's pretty weird. Afterward, Vlad's wife learns of his curse, but Vlad is still hot, so she's okay with it. You better not! You better not! That night, the Ottomans attack Vlad's peeps again, and this time some of his friends die, so much sadness. This dude over here is named Bright Eyes, and after killing one of Vlad's best men, Vlad scares him off the side of a cliff instead of killing him for some reason. Bright Eyes ends up becoming a problem later, as we'll see. Vlad's people hole up in some monastery, but Brother Lucian exposes him as a vampire, and a racist, and turns the people against him. But then Vlad yells at them and stuff happens, and then they're back on his side for the most part. Because rumors of Vlad being uber powerful are spreading around, the Sultan bad guy orders his army to wear blindfolds, which is kind of random, and I don't know if that's historically accurate. Also, we haven't mentioned it before, but Vlad Vlad's wife is very hysterical and very pale, and his son has a constitution of a fish. A floppy, wet fish. Do not let him look outside. Okay. Mama! Pathetic. Anyway, the bad guys arrive and Vlad's power will disappear soon because it's the third day. Around this time, the film goes completely bonkers. Vlad starts to use his power over the bats to control them and to make a giant fist. And then he takes that fist and then attacks the Ottoman Empire by just slamming it down into the army. Somehow this works. And afterwards he flies down to go fight them himself. But oh no, Bright Eyes is back and he's trying to take Vlad's wife and son once again. Also, once again, he kills one of Vlad's best men that was defending them, giving me a 
very strong sense of deja vu. The Turks chase the mother and child up the tower, and Vlad flies back super fast to save them. But then his wife falls off the tower! Vlad tries to catch her, but against all odds, he can't. I don't know how to describe this anymore. I mean, he was super fast before, but now he just can't catch up to her. And the green screen is horrendous. They both fall and hit the ground, but somehow, someone, in the amount of time it took for Vlad and his wife to fall, took Vlad's son and brought him all the way down the tower across the battlefield and loaded him on the Sultan's horse. How? I don't know. Whatever. So Vlad is cradling his wife, who somehow isn't already dead, and she tells him to suck her blood, so he can keep his vampire powers and rescue their son. Vlad eventually relents and does the evil suck, and I can't help but feel that they just reuse the scene in Morbius eight years later. I'm free! So, now doomed to be a vampire forever, he starts turning all the people who survived the Ottoman attack into vampires. Yes, that is what this movie has become. Vlad darkens the sky to hide away the sun, and charges in with his vampire army and fights the Sultan. And despite the Sultan having an unseemly amount of silver, Vlad kills him and saves his fish son. But oh no again! The people that Vlad turned into the vampires now want to suck on his son! because they have the taste for human blood. Luckily, that random monk, Brother Lucian, rushes in with a cross, and all the vampires, except for Vlad for some reason, shy away, and Vlad sends his son off with the monk. Vlad then undarkens the skies, and all the vampires burn up. Hey, it's me, your dry skin. But Vlad survives because he's wearing his special armor. Vlad, because he's immortal, is later seen in the present day, and the old vampire guy is still stalking him, and that's the end of the movie. We had to cut out some stuff for some time reasons, but that's the gist of the movie. There are some massive oversights in the writing, and the movie is fairly predictable and basic, feeling very much like a movie that has been written. But it's still kind of fun to watch. The special effects are pretty bad in some parts, but I won't hold that against the writers themselves. Overall, this is about as good as it gets from these guys. The movie got a box office of 217 million, so it was a decent success. But no sequel! Or was there? We'll give this movie a 6 out of 10, though in reality it's probably a lot lower, but we had fun watching it, and just this once, we shall inflate our score. So, for a first movie that they've written, it's not that bad, and it's not the worst movie I've ever seen. As we'll see, that changes, quite abruptly. Moving on to their second film. In 2015, the movie The Last Witch Hunter was released. It had a budget of 71 to 90 million dollars. It's a movie about Vin Diesel beating up witches, and the goal was to make the whole thing into a franchise if people liked it enough, and if it did well enough in the box office. Let's just say, I don't think we're gonna get that sequel. What would they call that anyway? The Last Witch Hunter 2? The Not-So-Last Witch Hunter? The movie stars Vin Diesel, who I'm sure you all know, as Calder, our main character, and The Last Witch Hunter. Michael Caine plays Dolan 36. Uh, he was in all kinds of stuff. You probably know him from Batman Begins, and uh, he's everywhere. We have Rosie Leslie, who uh, she was in Game of Thrones and some other things. She plays the character Chloe, and Elijah Wood from Lord of the Rings. Yes, that Elijah Wood is in this movie for some reason, and he plays Dolan 37. You'll understand the whole Dolan numbering thing later. The story begins with Calder killing the Witch Queen, but the witch is, well, a witch. And she curses him with immortality. Not too dissimilar from Dracula already. In fact, actually, the beginning scene is pretty similar in the way that they both open up with characters going to dark cave-like places and getting attacked by creepy human-like monsters. Now, in the present day, witches and humans live together in a truce, which prohibits the witches from using magic on humans. I'm not exactly sure what magic is in this universe exactly, as it's one of the elements in the story that's not really explained to us in excessive detail. But we do, however, have a voiceover telling us everything we need to know. Ha, second, second time, another voiceover. Which live among us in secret. The writing in this movie is surprisingly worse than Dracula, with the dialogue making characters talk past each other, but also just sounding really clunky. I've been called to introduce his name so he can seduce some random flight attendant. It comes off as really creepy. I need you to take a seat. My name is Calder. I need you to get back to your seat, Calder. I'd love to hear about growing up in Sefu. There's also moments when the characters aren't even really introduced, they just kind of appear, I guess. The movie also just tells you things and expects you to roll with it, making the world building not feel very immersive at all. The story involves Calder teaming up with some witch girl who's a dreamwalker, conveniently enough for the story, because they need a dreamwalker. And boy howdy, do we get a lot of mind stuff. It's kind of like Madame Web. The scenes of him having memory flashbacks happen way too often and last way too long. One of the essential plot points is that Calder needs to look back in his memory to remember the night that he killed the queen. He eventually learns in 
in what one might call a plot twist that the first Nolan, because they are basically Calder's butlers, they each get numbered as they go on. I guess we're on the 37th generation, but the Dolans did not destroy the heart of the witch, which would kill the witch forever, because doing so would kill Calder. We forgot to mention that the 36th Dolan, Michael Caine, was killed but not killed and apparently was tortured until he revealed the location of the heart, which is later used to revive the queen. The queen does get revived and starts releasing a plague upon all of humanity. I'm not really sure what her motivations are in this movie, nobody really cares. And Calder, Chloe, and the 37th Dolan go to stop her. But hark! Another plot twist! The 37th Dolan betrays the good guys because he's a simp, and the queen kills him because he's a beta male. Calder eventually defeats the queen, and the movie tries to gaslight the audience into believing that the film deserves a sequel. There's also some hints of what I think is supposed to be romance between Calder and Chloe. Oh! But considering the age difference and the fact that we keep on seeing flashbacks of Calder's wife and daughter, it makes more sense narratively if it was a father-daughter dynamic. In short, this is a very small brain movie. Not that that's always a problem, but this movie doesn't have good enough action, humor, characters, acting, or story to make it worth anyone's time. It's not so good, but it's also not so bad, it's good. If you don't watch this movie, you're missing out on absolutely nothing. The movie is called The Last Witch Hunter, and Calder barely hunts any witches at all. The movie ended up making 146 million against a budget of 90 million. But with advertising costs, I wouldn't be surprised if this movie lost money. We give this movie a 3 out of 10, would not watch again. 3 might be too high, I don't know. Quite possibly a 2 out of 10, but we'll say 3 out of 10 to be generous. So, they've written two dark fantasy type movies. Let's see what they do when they try something slightly different. In 2016, the following year, the two writers would have yet another masterpiece. This time the budget was even higher, at 140 million for a visual effects monstrosity. In the end, the movie would end up making around 150 million, so it maybe broke even, although along with marketing, I'm pretty sure it lost money. However, not every financial failure is a bad movie. But I don't think we're beating the trash film allegations with this one. The film stars Brenton Thwaites, which you'll know is Nightwing from the Titans, and he plays a character named Beck. Nicolae Coster-Waldo was in Game of Thrones and various other things. He plays Horus. Gerald Butler, who's in a lot of various things, he plays the villain Set. And Chadwick Boseman from Black Panther makes a surprise appearance as Thoth. This Swords and Sandal film is basically a whitewashed adaption of the Egyptian folklore, specifically the story of Horus and Set. And in the beginning, we get, guess what? DJ Khaled, voiceover, another I one! When history began, Egypt was the birthplace of all life. No! I'm beginning to think that these guys are a bit of a one-trick pony. The movie begins when Osiris, Horus' father, is killed by his evil brother Set before he can give his throne to his son. Horus loses a fight against his uncle, who predictably cheated, sort of. Set doesn't kill Horus because Hathor, goddess of love and lover of Horus, asks him to spare her boyfriend's life, and instead, he decides to take out Horus' eyes for some reason, and keeps them with his treasures for some other reason. Horus' mother, Isis, dies of grief, much like Padme, leaving Horus all sad, so he mopes around in a tomb, and Hathor, in exchange for Horus' life, presumably, starts sleeping with Set. Previously, she was sleeping with Horus, and it definitely seems like the only way the writers know how to show romance is either have them smile at their children, or have the big sex. Pulling a woman into the bath is preferred, but optional. A mortal human man named Beck gets one of Horus's eyes and offers to help him win back the throne in exchange for bringing his girlfriend Zaya back from the dead. They visit Horus's grandfather, Ra the Sun God, who is played by Joffrey Rush, and Ra just sits around on a spaceship and fights a giant space death worm. Truly, truly, this is one of the movies of all time. Because Set is a bad guy, we have to have a scene of him killing his own man for failure. He also knocks out Ra and lets loose the space worm so that he can fight it because he wants to become immortal. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Some stuff happens, Hathor joins them on the adventure, and Beck realizes that Horus lied about being able to bring back Zaya from the dead, and Beck gets upset. Hathor allows Beck to see Zaya once more, but giving away her bracelet allows her to be taken by some demons. Me thinks we just gotta move past all that. Horus learns to value the lives of mere mortals, and gets his powers back after saving Beck, instead of getting his other eye. Even though, if he had just gotten his other eye, he could have activated his powers and flown to catch him. But this is better, this is more predictable. Horus kills set and takes back the kingdom. Shortly afterwards, he gets his other eye and regains his powers, but Beck dies. 
But do not worry, Ra defeats the space worm and brings Beck and his girlfriend back to life. So in the end, it really didn't matter. Gods of Egypt is a movie best described as a movie where things just happen. Sort of as we described with the last film this duo wrote, it's a movie for people who either aren't very smart or are not paying attention. Once again, the movie opens up with a voiceover to provide exposition, and many lines of dialogue are merely exposition about what just happened. The movie basically has no substance and the characters are pretty one-dimensional. And most of the things that happen don't really matter that much. The story only really exists as a vessel for the action. And while not a mark against the writers necessarily, the action looks really horrible because 95% of the movie is CGI and the CGI is not good. The gods in this movie can transform into metal armor things and that looks very, very, very weird. It seems cool on the poster, but it's just goopy and bad in the movie. In addition to all these problems, the movie is not very faithful to to Egyptian folklore. This is not only because everyone in the movie is not Egyptian, but also because the story is completely different. The original story is almost nothing like the movie in too many ways really to mention. For one, Set and Horus had a competition to see who would be king, not a war. In the original story, Isis also doesn't die. There's no climactic battle scene with Set. Beck is not a character at all, and he's not even in Egyptian folklore from what I can tell. There is a historical Beck, but he was a sculptor. The writers also ignored the time they transformed into hippos and the infamous lettuce incident of which we do not speak of. As mentioned before, the would-be blockbuster was a failure, only earning a gross of $150 million on a budget of 140, and people for the most part didn't like it, and neither did we. We'll give this movie a 3 out of 10, although it is more enjoyable than The Last Witch Hunter. Barely. We were never really the biggest fans of Power Rangers. We don't hate it. You just never really watched it. We are more of Ultraman stands. However, in 2017, imagine our surprise when we heard that Power Rangers was going to try to break into the mainstream with a Hollywood movie with a budget of $100 million. Most of the shows and TV movies before this point had shoestring budgets. So this was going to be interesting. For some unknown reason, our favorite dynamic writing duo was tasked with writing the story along with two other writers, though they didn't write the final script. One might question, why are there so many writers? The movie didn't have a ton of star power. This guy was in Stranger Things. Betty Brandt from Spider-Man 2 was the villain? Brian Cranston's voice was in the movie, and his face was in a wall. And for the most part, a lot of the other younger stars just moved up from this later. The story is about a bunch of angsty teens that meet in detention. Later, they discover an ancient Kryptonian ship, I, I mean Power Ranger ship, and gain superpowers. Brian Cranston's face is in a wall, and he teaches them how to become Power Rangers and to defeat the villain. The villain is Rita Repulsar, a former ranger who betrayed her team to steal the Earth's Zero Crystal. Um, a Zero Crystal is something with like unlimited power and sustains the planet, blah blah blah. The movie has a lot of exposition. The teens start to train to use their powers and become Power Rangers, and they have really interesting personalities and origin stories. Jason, the Red Ranger, is the leader and is the light version of Kirk from Star Trek 2009. He played a prank that went wrong and now his football career is over. Billy the Blue Ranger is autistic and his dad died. Trini the Yellow Ranger is a moody, angsty girl. She moves a lot and doesn't have friends. Zack the Black Ranger is a reckless, fatherless child and his mom is sick with something. We saved Kimberly the Pink Ranger for last because... Oh boy, you you see her personality is really plain and almost non-existent, but her origin story is something else. She's in detention for punching a guy for saying that she was, quote unquote, the meanest person he'd ever met. He said this because she leaked a nude photo of one of her teammates to her boyfriend, the person who she punches. Because of this, she was ousted from her friend group. So basically, she leaked a nude photo of some girl to that girl's boyfriend, and then she punched the boyfriend because the boyfriend said that she was being a mean person. The movie then shares the message that just because you did something bad doesn't mean that you can't move past it, which is fine, but she never apologizes for her actions to her former friends, and later those former friends' car is destroyed in a battle, and she says, that's what you get, as though they are the bad guys. That's what you get. The writers really dropped the ball with this one. Rita collects a bunch of gold to revive the giant Goldar, and the rangers get past their teen drama to morph and protect the town, and defeat her with the Megazord. I can't necessarily place the blame for all the bad elements on the story team, since they didn't write it, but you can definitely see that they tainted it. The shallow team drama rears its ugly head in Madame Web later, and once again we have a poorly written semi-immortal villain. In general, the story is pretty bad and generic, and even if it was written well, the story still would have sucked. 3.5 out of 10. Some people like it, but I don't. From 2018 to 2021, Mr. Mark and Mr. Burke were busy making a product that people actually were okay with. Lost in Space, a sci-fi show that is a remake of the 1965 show of the same name, and it got fairly favorable reviews from both critics and audience. 
Personally, Keto and I only watched season one and thought it was just okay. Although looking back on it, it is interesting how apparently they replaced a chimpanzee with a black woman. We no longer have a monkey on the show. We have an actual woman on the show. What did you just say? Plus in this interview, it just feels like they're trying to pander to people in a way that feels kind of gross and disingenuous. Um, well, I, I will say uh, our family is very much updated, which involved, which includes Maureen Robinson, the mother, and uh, the two daughters, Penny and Judy. So I think what you would be most surprised by is how uh, they're kind of running the show in a lot of ways. <laughs> Maureen Robinson is the matriarch. She's a rocket scientist. She's super capable. Regardless, it was certainly better than anything they'd write for feature-length films. We're not going to rate this series because we didn't finish it. Now they had the little period of, oh, this is actually pretty good, maybe these guys should go write some more movies. And then came the most infamous project of their career. It's Morbin time. When anyone wants to say that a superhero movie is bad, they will more than likely compare it to Morbius, which is impressive, since the movie isn't even two years old yet. That says a lot about how bad Morbius is, and how bad superhero movies have gotten. If movies like Catwoman, or Ghost Rider, or Elektra had been released in the 2020s, the backlash and quantity of memes would have been quite similar. So basically, Morbius sent all superhero movies back two decades. The writing is some of the most incomprehensible, clunky, unrealistic, and flat-out boring slog you will encounter. Yet, it's just bad enough that you're almost forced to finish the movie once you start it. There's also similar themes to Dracula Untold in this movie, mostly because they're both vampires, obviously. They both use bats in unrealistic, silly ways. They both have girlfriends that die and are told to suck said girlfriends dry. Did you mean to rhyme there? Uh, no. No. Oh. They're the same picture. And in the end, they both get their butts handed to them until the plot steps in and decides, that's enough, and lets the good guy win. The visual effects also aren't too dissimilar, although Morbius is a lot harder to see what's going on, strangely enough. Now, there are a few scenes in which the mobbing occurs that are so bad <laughs> that they are good. But other than that, there's not that much that's going on. It is certainly not the worst superhero movie in existence, but it's so, ugh, it feels that way. We don't want to go into extreme detail into how bad it is because I'm sure you've heard it all before. But if you're interested in a full review, let us know in the comments down below. In short, this movie is awful. 11 out of 10. He was in the Amazon with my mom when she was researching spiders right before she died. We've already covered Madame Web on our channel, so we won't go into a bunch of nitty gritty details, but this movie sucks. The movie has another really bad introduction with some of the worst writing anyone has ever made. Uh, my, my, my take on, well, first of all, I agree with, 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 with Karam. Uh, just so you know, Karam started the entire process. We have another emotional character, the villain with a rather bad backstory that really doesn't make any sense is never really explored. The main character also had an awful backstory because, by using a flashback, the writers managed to destroy any and all mysteries surrounding these two characters' origins. There is an attempt to mix in themes of family into the story, but they all fall miserably flat, and the characters are all cardboard cutouts. But someone forgot to print the person on the front! Spider Girls have no character development, and they are just there to be a tease for a movie that will never be made. Like in the trailer, you see that, oh, look, the Spider Woman in here, but they have all of maybe two and a half minutes of screen time. This is just a movie that serves no purpose and appeals to almost nobody. Its writing is completely watered down and generic and full of tropes, and quite honestly, the only people who'd enjoy this are people who think it's so bad it's good. The script was pretty good, and so, you know, sometimes some things would come out that we would keep, but but um, mo for the most part, it, like, the scenes worked as they were. Honestly, I actually prefer Morbius more. Somehow it comes off more as a bad, good movie, rather than Madame Web that just comes off as a bad, bad movie. This isn't too offensive, although they did our boy Ezekiel very, very dirty. The best part of the movie is when she said it's webbing time and webbed all over the room. Uh, two out of ten. We have a full, like, 15-minute review on our channel if you want to see us go into more depth, but otherwise, yeah, it's a bad movie. So, based on our investigation, what have we learned about these writers? Well, they definitely seem to like the whole immortal vampire people dressed in dark clothing, such as Dracula Untold and The Last Witch Hunter and Gods of Egypt with Set, kind of, Power Rangers with the villain, Morbius and Milo, I guess, and Madame Webb's Ezekiel. Also, it's weird that the bad guys are always rich. 
It seems common that they tend to pander to the audience or to current year politics, as many in Hollywood do. We have uh, these three uh, incredible women. Our film is very much updated. That said, they were also involved in the Gods of Egypt, which was accused of whitewashing Egyptian history, though they probably had no control over that at all. On the other hand, other than Vin Diesel and The Last Witch Hunter, every single one of their main characters has been white. Not that I care, just something to note. In almost all of that movies, there's almost no character development, unless it's been over-telegraphed in the very beginning of the movie. Gods of Egypt is about the only one with legitimate development, and that was pretty basic. Most of their movies are also pretty boring, and nothing happens until an event just happens to happen, like someone triggered a boss battle. All the movies are of very little consequence or substance. No one will walk away from the theater thinking about the themes of the story. They'll more than likely be thinking about how they wasted two hours. The only one we really had kind of fun with was Dracula Untold, and some Power Rangers fans like the 2017 movie. I don't know why, I thought it was pretty bad, but to each their own. One really big question is, how do these guys keep on getting work when every single movie sucks and they don't really do that well at the box office either? The last two flopped hard, so it's weird that they still get any kind of work at all. In conclusion, is this the worst writing duo in Hollywood? Probably. Though there are some people out there who give him a good run for their money. So what do you think? Is this the worst writing duo in Hollywood? Or is there someone who is far worse? And did you like any of these movies? Or did you think all of them were just awful? Let us know. But whether you comment or not, thank you for watching this far. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to like and subscribe. And if you wanted to watch another video that's kind of similar, watch this one over here. Or perhaps this one over here. And until we see you in the next one, he is Inspector Keto. And he is Detective Mio. And we hope you have a blessed day. Bye! Bye. Um, <laughs> my writing partner vanished. Uh,